Assalamu alaikum guys, welcome back to Dean Machine. You're here with Mush. Assalamu alaikum guys, it's Rizwan again. Assalamu alaikum, it's Asad. Assalamu alaikum, it's Kaji. So, I know it's been a while guys, but today we're going to be discussing about the Muslim youth. Because obviously we hear here today, we see in the news that there's a lot of people getting involved in gangs, uh, killing each other, stabbings, guns, drugs, the whole lot. And um, we think it's a really big concern and the Ummah should be really trying to tackle these issues. So that's what we're going to be discussing today. Who wants to take the first shot? Definitely a very important topic, so especially for parents who are looking for a solution, how to deal with this issue, uh, what, what things they need to discuss with the youth. And very important for the youth themselves, uh, ideally this is uh, tailored for who are at the, who are trapped in the system and they, they are looking for help or advice, practical advice how they can overcome these issues that they're having uh, to better themselves and come out of this uh, uh, hostile environment and improve, they come closer to Islam, inshallah this podcast will really help them. I mean, yeah, I mean, the question obviously arises that why are the youth, Muslim youth, are attracted to this kind of lifestyle? Um, I mean, we, li- we live in a world where it's, uh, which is ruled by secular capitalist ideology. And I personally believe the root cause of all this it starts at quite a young age. The ideas which are prevalent within society and how uh, the children are you know, educated through school, college, university, uh, and it's self-centered around the individual. Obviously, the ideology itself is all about the individual, how I can succeed. And the success is seen and measured in terms of materialistic gain. So, you know, if you take an example of two youths, or one who's uh, gone through the education system, he's got a degree, he applies for a job, uh, he's working in a you know, good company, and it's all about work, 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 work for one promotion, second promotion, third promotion. Or you've got another individual who takes the route of, which we're talking about, drugs and fraud, or whatever they might get involved in. The idea to become rich and to gain that material wealth has emanated from the same root cause, which is the ideology, which is the secular ideology itself. And the end goal, which they see as success by achieving all this wealth, is the same as well. But one obviously has gone through the correct way in terms of earning the rizq and the second one's taken the uh, haram way basically in terms of the rizq. The solution therefore, or in terms of how we can at least try and tackle this idea, the problem I think is the fact that these youths, they're not taught a, a contrary idea to what they learn, yeah. basically in their daily lives through college, whatever it may be, or with friends, yeah? Mm. And this idea is the idea of Islam. They, they don't see Islam as an ideology, it's, it's taught to them as a set of rituals. Mm. So, you know, they pray their Salah, they taught their Salah, they recite the Qur'an, or whatever the basic five pillars of Islam are. But they don't understand it as an ideology, as a way of life. So I think until that doesn't happen, until we don't start teaching Islam as ought to be taught, uh, whether it be in madrasas, masjids, or you've got these celebrity scholars, nobody actually addresses the core problem in society. Yeah. It's all about what emanates from there. Yeah, because I get what you mean, because um, obviously when I look at the Muslim youth, right, um, we weren't too far from the youth anyway, I'm 23, so it's, it's not too long ago. Well, um, what, what I find is that you get the two different um, spectrums, right? You get the first individual that is literally joining gangs, doing drugs, selling drugs, just for the to live that high life, you know, that 50 cent, get rich or die trying life, one of those ones. That's the one individual. But then you get the other side of the spectrum, right? Where you get the individual that literally is probably grew up single parent or maybe like the parents are divorced or maybe one of the parents have passed away, has no real guidance, right? And maybe they're going through some tough times, financial, like financial difficulties and all that stuff. He has no choice but to go to do drugs and sell drugs to make a living, to feed for and um, you know, to provide for his family. So you get these type of two different types of spectrums mm-hmm. and all again it comes from the fact that maybe they don't have that true understanding of what life is, what it really means. And again it comes down to the fact that they don't have that right education about Islam. Yeah. So definitely so you know the youth are very precious and you know and what the what the society does incorrectly is there a lot of blame goes on to the youth. 
uh, I mean they have so much pressures from social uh, social media or the society in itself so what we should be looking at the point we need to address is how can we change the uh, the behavior so we have talked about the root cause we need to understand the root cause these concepts that are uh, because of these uh, deep rooted concepts of secularism individualism that leads to this degraded behavior so if if I, if I want to change my ch a child or my brother or my sister um, the Muslim youth, how do I go about changing behavior? Now, to change someone's behavior, it's very important to understand, is you have to change the concepts that they hold uh, in the brain about life, about things. That needs to be fundamentally changed. Because if you don't change the concepts that they hold, uh, what the purpose of life is, what they see, uh, how they view the viewpoint towards life, if you don't change that fundamental thought, and you give them uh, just the rules, they yeah. would never change. So, for example, uh, let me give you a crude example. It could be a drug dealer. You might be telling him pray. You know, the solution might be to, you need to pray your salah. And a lot of the, let's be honest, I know a lot of the drug dealers, uh, they drug deal and they pray the salah. They'll be, yeah, they, they, they in off. fact, will be in Jummah and they'll, they'll give the most amount of money for charity in well, Jummah. They'll be the first line of the Ravi, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's Ravi, uh, the all of them uh, uh, with the topics are poor. So it's not the it's very important mm -hmm. to understand. So it's not the rules how you change these individuals, but it's changing the concepts. Yeah. And you know this beautiful wisdom. If you look at it, you know if you look at Revelation of the Quran, if you look at the first thirteen years of uh, Revelation of the Quran, there were no rules real. Yeah. Why? And if you look at um, what type of uh, verses the Meccan phase, what kind of verses were revealed, they all to do with concepts. So the concepts to do with uh, belief in Allah, uh, the concept of heaven, the con uh, concept of uh, hell, mm -hmm. and accountability of uh, one's actions. So once all these uh, concepts were revealed and it shaped the people's thoughts and the concepts, then later on, or uh, uh, after the 13th year in Medinian phase, mm. all the rules of Islam were revealed then. And the famous uh, saying of Aisha Rita Anhu, she said, look, if the rules of Islam were to come in Meccan phase, nobody w would have accepted Islam. Yeah, right. So it's a very deep wisdom we could take from there to understand that, look, to ch that, that is the methodology we need to do. So inshallah, we'll look into the concepts, specific ones, mm. we need to address with the youth and what we need to change. Yeah, because uh, one thing that I was looking at in regards to the, you know, the youth getting into these street street gangs, etc., you know, living that high high lifestyle, as you already said, you know, because they want to get quick cash, isn't it? Like the society that we're in right now, so Western society it promotes, it promotes what? Capitalism, right? So we need to look at that angle as well, like Mush said, that... Yeah, there's a certain lifestyle that they had, that they had, mom don't have no money, they need to take care, so we need to get some quick cash, right? But, you got to look at an angle as well, in regards to, okay, that's that, then after you got the other one, which is the student lifestyle, like, you know, I've seen, I've been at university, at Dumont University, people go uni, right, they don't have any money, so guess what they do? They sell drugs. See, so the, it's, it's that gap that they're having as well. It's, it, it's very large in the Muslim community for some reason. But how do we tackle that? That's the main question as well. How do we implement that the concept within our youth? I mean, the, the way, like I say, the way the deen is taught, I think there's a fundamental, the first step, which is actually missing, like I say, in mosques and uh, even in our homes, and I mean, many years ago, when I when I started uh, practicing, obviously, you know, I believed in, I'm a Muslim. I believed in Islam. I believed in the Quran. But could I sit in front of an atheist and have a debate with him? If some atheist said to me, yeah. "Prove to me that your God exists," I wouldn't have a clue what to say. And I think the fundamental issue lies there in the understanding of the deen. So, mm -hmm. the first step I think is to to rationally go through the process and explain to them that without doubt that there is a Creator. Yeah. You know what I mean? So even though, yes, they're Muslims, they believe, this step will help me, it definitely helped me, because I, you know, I came across certain ideas, came across certain brothers. It solidifies that belief for you in Islam and in the Creator. 
you know, now I could sit in front of anyone and I could debate that that without any doubt mm -hmm. there's a creator. I could I could go through that debate. Yeah. Once our youth understand this process, rationally up in their head, they could process this and they know for a fact. I mean obviously they believe in the last month already. Yeah. But the fact once they go through this process, like I say, it solidifies their belief. There's no room mm -hmm. for any doubt left at all after this once you've gone through this rational process of proving that Allah exists yeah. and the Quran is the speech of Allah and the Prophet is the message of Allah. Yeah, I think it's key for us to kind of address this, like, uh, uh, this idea of this concept, right, being embedded within a uh, Muslim, whether they're the youth or a child or whatever it is, I think is very important because these type of issues, you're not going to hear about it in the Juma Khutbah, right? You know, for, this, for some reason, um, the real issues that surround the Ummah aren't addressed in the masjids and stuff. You know, when I was a kid grow, going to Madrasa and stuff like that, um, we just learned about Quran and Hadith and stuff, which is great. Honestly, it's great. But we're not taught about real life issues, right? And how to apply what we learn in reading and stuff to our lives. And I think this is very important because when we solidify this concept and it crystallizes within us, these issues in regards to like risk and stuff, which is I think one of the main yeah. key components yeah, yeah, yeah. here, uh, risk is also tackled as well right because obviously we know that uh, risk is fixed um, because we have that crystallized concept within us that obviously Islam is true Allah is um, there's only one Allah and he provides Allah is a provider so obviously the concept of risk um, uh, how to earn it in the halal or halal manner um, around or halal manner gets answered right yeah remind me you know the uh, hadith of uh, Muhammad sallam he so narrated awesome. that barely you have asked Allah about the duration of life which is already set and the steps you will take and the sustenance, the shape of which is fixed. So nothing will take place before its due time and nothing will be deferred beyond when it is due. So a Muslim has a strong conviction of the mm. Allah yeah. that created him. And he had a strong conviction, uh, conviction that the risk he's going to have in his lifetime is already fixed. Yeah. Now the common sense thing to do is do we achieve that risk to the halal means? Because for example, if those people who have achieved it to the uh, haram means, then to understand that risk, what they attained, they would have got that anyway. They were yeah, destined right. for that. However, how they achieved that, that they're totally accountable for that. Because they could achieve the exact same, that was destined for them yeah. to the halal channels, but they didn't. And that is going to be a severe punishment for them. And they have to understand that, you know, study about the Creator Himself. You know, one of the name of Allah Samantha is uh, a result. He's a provider. Mm -hmm. So He's your sustainer. He's the one who provides for you. And your lifespan is already fixed. So you can't increase or decrease it how you want it to. So why would you waste your lifetime in disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yeah, you're definitely right in regards to that. I mean, you know, like I said, selling drugs, you know, it disobeys somebody else's life. You know, it's completely haram. You know, like I say, I've, I even speak to people nowadays you know, and tell them that, you know, your rizik is fixed. You know, at the end of the day, if you're, um, you know, just say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is written, that you're going to get a million pounds. It's just the way that you actually go about it. But one thing that I've noticed as well is that going through the haram route is much more easier. But going through the halal route in this dunya is very difficult. It's like obstacles, one after the other. You see? But at the end, you get Jannah. That's the main thing. And I youth don't understand that. That's the thing. They think, okay, I need to get the money quick. You see? So, you know, that's one of the things about music that many people don't. I didn't, I didn't even understand that either. You see, um, at the age of 19, thinking that, you know, my music, I thought that, you know, if I work hard, I'll get all that I can get. And after, you know, when you study within Islam and you think, oh, the music is fixed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives and takes at the end of the day. That's what it is. Yeah, it goes back to what the brother was saying that some people might get into this in drugs or whatever because purely because they were, maybe they were poor, they struggled, they were yeah. in debt, whatever it may be. But if they understood this concept of risk that Allah is the provider, 
they wouldn't they wouldn't go down that route. They would always always try and find the halal option uh, to to earn their wealth. Uh, but you know the point you make in terms of haram is always easier at the start maybe. But as mm. to, no matter how you when you go to haram at the start is all luxury and everything and you know, things are good good. But I mean if you look at these drug dealers, do they live an easy life? No, they threaten mm. of getting stabbed, shot. People after them going to fights all the time, they live a very stressful life, man. Yeah. They're always scared for their life and you know, fear for their life. You know, they don't know if they're going to go out the house, whether they come back safe or not. So is it worth taking that risk mm. on top of that, gaining the displeasure or displeasure of Allah SWT? Or would you rather take the halal option, gain the pleasure of Allah and live a more peaceful life? Definitely. Yeah, um, yeah I was going to say because obviously at first you might think, all right, buy a brick of coke, break it down. You know, you could um, double it, maybe triple the amount you get back in return. Mm. Is it really worth it? Because, yes, initially, maybe you make a quick quick pound or two, you know what I mean? But, again, you go through those fears of, okay, look, I'm, I'm fearing for my life on a daily basis, right? Second of all, you could probably never buy anything with that money that you earned anyway. Mm. You know, taxes and that, you know what I mean? They're going to be like, yo, tax man's going to be like, where's this guy getting the money from? That's mm. just one of the things as well, but Thirdly, you're displeasing Allah, right? You're doing all of that. You're risking your life. You're risking going to jail, serving sometimes like 10, 15 years of a sentence, you know. And obviously, we all know how jails and stuff are. You're just in confinement, you know. You're what? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, you've done it to benefit your family in the first place, but it's you're true. in jail. What, what good are you in jail for, to your family, right? Um, it's just one of those things. Plus, on top again, you're displeasing Allah. Is it really worth all of that yeah, to displease Allah? When you could do the halal method, which I think people might think it's harder, but once you go on the halal method, it becomes everything's everything's much simpler for you, right? As soon as you put that trust in Allah SWT, that everything's going to be okay. No, even if you go homeless, bankrupt, whatever it is, yeah? As long as you believe that and trust in Allah, everything's going to be okay. Then I don't see where the hardness, hardship is for it. He'll always make a way out for you if you trust in Him. You yeah. know, Allah says, put your trust in the Quran, put your trust in Him. He loves those who put their trust in Him. Yeah. So, yeah. Exactly, Allah never burdens the soul with more than it can uh, handle. Exactly. Yeah, the verse in the Surah at Talaq, uh, verse 2 and 3, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Whoever fears Allah, He will make out a way for him and He will provide for him which He does not even expect. Hmm. So, this is from our Creator telling us, Would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever lie to us? No oh. way. So, He's telling us already that you know, fear of Him, He's, he's the one provides. So, he, there's examples in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about. You know, I'll give example of the birds. You look, uh, look at the birds when they go out in the morning, looking food for the for the children, uh, for the chicks. But they come back with the food uh, end of the end of the day. And Allah want to say, look, put your trust in Allah. The fact that He can provide these animals mm. because of trust in Allah. Same same application applies for us. Mm. But you know, I was just, I was just uh, thinking about these punishments. We're talking about, you know, when you read about the punishments of in hellfire, this is the most terrifying punishment um, we can think of. And I'm just looking at just after some of the least uh, torturous punishment in hellfire. Mm -hmm. May Allah save us from it. But when you think about this, you will never want to go near the haram, uh, haram things which Allah has forbidden. You know, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and he's talking about hellfire, the punishment. Superheated water will be poured onto the heads and will dissolve through it until it cuts off the inards, expelling them until it comes out from the feet and everything is melted. Mm -hmm. Then they will be restored as they were, and this process will repeat again. So, so just imagine, imagine you burn yourself just slightly, you're how painful this is. This is water being poured on you and everything melting. Imagine that constant pain, and the Allah's Father restores you again, and it happens again. Continuous. Is it worth it? Yeah. And you know, um, regarding um, uh, drugs, uh, alcohol, you know, Allah SWT tells us, all you who believe, intoxicants, so this includes all anything that which is common, uh, and gambling, or uh, adulterous practices, and diving with arrows, or repugnant acts, they are shaitan's work. Shun them so you may prosper with intoxicant and gambling. Satan seeks to only to incite enmity and hatred among you. 
and to stop you remembering Allah and prayer. So will you not give up? So Allah SWT tell you all these things you think you quick money. Allah is telling you these are shaitan's work. You're, you're not, you're not uh, looking for quick access. You're working for shaitan himself with these acts. And you know, one thing uh, I remind all these youth, right? You know, uh, they always think because of the crowd, they're waiting as well. You know, my boys, this is the common technology that they mm. use. You know, they, especially for the youth that are listening, I really, you t- really t- understand this point. Think about it, the day you were born, you came alone to this world. Your boys weren't there, your boys didn't give you birth or life to you. It was Allah, your creator gave it to you. And he's the one who's going to take it away from you. And on that day of judgment, when you stand it, and that day of judgment is not a fairy tale or possibility is going to happen. We know for 100% fact that a day is going to come for all of us. Mm. So when you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's going to count you for your whole life, all the actions that you did, do you think any of your boys will come in and vouch for you on that day? Your own mother won't even vouch for you, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. So none of your boys is gonna be around so you'll take so called a bullet for or you know, give your life up for commit crimes with. None of them gonna be around. Even your own mother will ignore you on that day. Mm. So what are you living in life for? You live in a delusional um life with with these friends, but even on the day of judgment your boy is not gonna help you out at all. So is it worth it? To be fair, even before it gets to the day of judgment, bro, if you tell one of these boys, you know, in um, inverted commas, if you tell these boys you want to leave this lifestyle, you know, let's see how they react then. They, it's not going to be a good thing, you know what I'm trying to say? It, it, it's not just about leaving. If you, if you look at this concept of our boys and we'll do anything for them, etc. You know, if one of them gets caught or a few of them get caught, they get caught. And one of them is looking at a 10, 15, 20 year sentence. Mm-hmm. All this boy's business is out the window. In a split second, they will grasp all the rest of the boys up. Yeah, to get a reduced sentence. This one did this, this one did this. Just to get a reduced sentence, we'll get away with it. Yeah. And, you know, all this talk about, we'll take a bullet. When the bullets are flying, nobody's going to stand in front of you and take a bullet. Trust mm-hmm. me, nobody's going to do that. No matter how much they claim. At least in this gang culture, there's really no true friends. Because when they're... When, when, when they're when it comes to it, when it boils down to it and stuff goes really wrong, yes, they might go and fight with you or jump someone and do this and do that. But when the police get involved and they're looking at sentences or they're looking at getting shot themselves, then trust me, the, 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 all this boys' business is out the window. Mm-hmm. And then obviously that same thing plays in the, uh, on the Day of Judgment where if you've had evil companions in this world, on the Day of Judgment they're going to run away from you. They're going to blame each other and they're going to be witnesses against each other, as the Quran says. Uh, for all the evil that they did. So is it really worth it? And uh, another quick point on this, I was, I, was uh, I mean, as obvious as it sounds, you know, it, it is important to link this life directly with the hereafter. I mean, in the past I've spoken to, you know, I've spoken to this brother once a few years back, and I said something to him, and he goes, oh, we'll see what happens. He's talking about the Day of Judgment. And I said to him, no, whatever you do in this life plays the, the outcome, the result, depends on what you do in this life, basically, on the Day of Judgment. Yeah. So you can't just do whatever you wish here and then hope for a good result there. Mm. You understand? You have to live your life according to Islam here, pray for Allah's mercy, and then, inshallah, achieve that eternal bliss. Instead of thinking that you're living some, you know, some really good blissful life in this world, which is only going to last our most, what, 60, 70, 80 years or whatever. And even then, the part of that is a healthy life. Once you get past 60, 70 years, like, you know, you're almost on one leg and dependent on others and all sorts. So, yeah, that, that's another thing we need to address. Yeah. And they really need to ask themselves, what we're doing, is it really worth sacrificing eternity? Yeah. What interests me is, uh, do you know what it is? Um, what interests me is these youths, right? They understand all of this. They understand what they're doing is wrong. They understand that they need another option, right? Like, I was talking to this one brother, he's deep in, like, this type of lifestyle. He's telling me, look, I really want to go to Umrah, I really want to go to uh, Hajj, I really want to start praying and all that stuff. But I feel like I'm not worthy, you know, because I've done all this lifestyle. I took and says, listen, have you even tried asking for Allah's forgiveness? Allah forgives all. If you seek for his forgiveness, he will forgive you. 
as long as you do it in the proper way and you repent in the proper way, right? It's it's one of these ones like obviously the youth may not have that much knowledge in regards to this type of thing. They feel like, look, I'm not worthy of being a Muslim or I'm not worthy of the title of Muslim or I'm not worthy of standing in prayer um, in the line in the prayer in the prayer room next to them a really good man. But you every each of us go through our own difficulties and our own hardships. But again, it comes down to the fact that you need to put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You need to repent. You need to ask for forgiveness and lead your life accordingly to Islam. Then you'll see that things will fall into place for you, right? If if you walk towards Allah, Allah runs towards you. If you really take this um, ayah into consideration, you'll, uh, you'll find that everything becomes clear, right? It's like it's like your windscreen wipers. <laughs> you know, your, wind, your window gets dirty and your, um, the wipers come and clear it off. That's how powerful it is. It's like you're clearing your vision. Definitely, uh, solid points there. You know, we're, we're talking about the points about choosing friends wisely mm. um, and the bad companion. Allah SWT tells us in the Quran what will happen to those people, they will really regret it on the day of judgment. The verse, uh, Surah 25, uh, verse 27, Allah SWT says, I remember the day when the wrongdoer will bite on his hand and he will say, Oh, would that I have taken a path with the messenger? Uh, woe to me, would that I had never taken so and so as a friend. He indeed led me astray from the reminder, the Quran, after he had come to me. So here Allah SWT had given a description of these individuals who took the bad, bad companionship uh, aboard, on board and which led them to disobey Allah SWT and his reminder. And on that day, they'll bite in their hands and cursing themselves. And they'll say, look, why, why did I take these guys, my boys, as my companions? And it's, they're the ones who led me astray. So look here, Allah SWT telling you already in advance, look, you got a chance here. Your boys are leading you to your destruction. So one of the practical advice I give to the brothers, to the youth, if you're in that one, the heart is the, the most powerful thing you can do uh, if you're already in it and the most uh, uh, it will really help you is to break away from your circle it's yeah. going to be very painful yeah. very difficult but trust me it will work if you look for a real solution way out of it because once you come out of your bad companionship look for brothers who are in the good uh, with the, uh, who fear Allah in the right circle trust me most of your problem will eliminate but no matter what you do, uh, you must start to do, uh, do recitation more or uh, try to pray more. Or well, long as in, in that circle of friends, you will never come out of it. Um, yeah, and some brothers, some of the youth might be thinking, you know, this is theoretic. It's not, I could say for myself, as a youth, uh, I was in the same situation as well. And that was the most powerful thing, more effective thing that worked for me as well. So, and the many verses in the Quran and Hadith tell us of this as well. And another powerful narration many of you come across is a Hadith of Prophet Sallam. He says, he Sallam says, the example of a good companion, friend, is comparison uh, compared to a bad one, is like the one who sells mosque and the blacksmith. So from the first one, you either buy the mosque or you enjoy his good smell. So he has given an example of a good companion. While from the blacksmith, you would either get burned or smell a bad scent. So where, where he's talking about the one who's selling the mosque, you'll have the good smell. Even if you're just mm. hanging around with them, it will give you the good vibe. Mm. That, that those yeah. who fear Allah SWT. But those who are the, those away from Allah SWT, you might not be doing that same action or being around them they will have a negative impact on you. Yeah, 100% I agree with that because um, obviously uh, if you're around good people and stuff, whether you're good or not yourself, <laughs> right? if you're around the good people or whatever it is, that good will rub off on you. And again, if you're a good person and you're hanging around in a bad crowd, maybe that bad will rub off on you or even worse, you might get sinned, yeah? Because you're not speaking up against it. Do you know what I'm trying to say? So it's, there's bad in every single direction, like... If you hang out with good, good rub off on you. If you hang around with the bad people or any bad environment, mm -hmm. the bad will rub off on you. Yeah, because you get peer, peer pressured, for example, within groups. You know, you have a couple of friends that say that, oh, look, this is how much I'm making. 
And you know what? You should come along and you know sell some drugs over there. You know, make a quick sixty pound from my aunt or something like that. You know, you have that in, in actual reality. You know, and you might think to yourself, oh, you know, I'm never gonna do the bad thing, or I'm never gonna smoke the mm -hmm. marijuana. I'm just chilling with my boys. But trust me, one after you, you might not be smoking the star. Yeah. Later on, the smell will catch up in it. Later down the line, you won't even believe you how you got into it. Mm -hmm. And you know the Mama sort of told her about this in terms of when you're choosing your friend, this is what you need to keep in your mind. So Prophet Sallam said, your best friend is the one when you see him, he reminds you of Allah. Speaking to him increases your knowledge, and his action reminds you of the hereafter. So think about this, so whatever type of friends you got, uh, hanging around with or you're going to meet, does it fit this description? If it doesn't remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or, or brings you close to him or increase your knowledge, is he really your friend? In the true definition of friend, or is he gonna be, or this person or uh, she going to be your path for destruction? It really boils down to that. Because remember, at the end of the day, on the day of judgment, every man for himself, you can't blame me on your friend, you can't blame me on your parents. They might have contributed towards it, but it's you, Allah has given us the akal to decide. Mm -hmm. And Allah SWT sent uh, Muhammad SAW so, so. and with the deen to remind us all this. So we can't make up any excuse on the day of judgment. Yeah, just going back to the point which Rizman made, I think it's a very good point where <coughs> when you're trying to change um, your lifestyle from halal, yeah, yeah. Uh, haram lifestyle into, you know, Islamic lifestyle. The attack from shaitan at that point is it is it's real, yeah, it's real, yeah. yeah. And one of the common questions or one of the common thoughts which run across your mind is that my daily life is around certain people. I chill with certain people, mix with certain people. If I get away from this drugs, so if I get away from this lifestyle, I'm going to be by myself. What am I going to do? And the only thing I could advise is if, you, if you're really sincere, you, you ask Allah SWT for help, you get away from that, you give up that company up, and inshallah Allah will replace your bad company with good company. And that's guaranteed to happen. And in our head, sometimes we can't imagine that. Um, you know, you're always going to think to yourself, you know, what am I going to do? Because we used to go and chill with the boys, and we used to do this, and we used to do that. Instead of this, how am I going to pass time? And you will find activities to do which will please Allah and because you'll be around righteous company. You will still you know you don't have to come boring and depressed. You know, you could you could have a really good, exciting life, you know, living according to Islam as well. Where people you know people think sometimes on the country where they come across certain imams or Mulbis and they're always angry and they think, well, yeah, if you start practicing, you've got to become like them. <laughs> but you, you could have a good life, you know what I mean? You obviously yeah. young young people practice. I'm, I like to think I'm young. Only 40, yeah, 41, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, can, you can have a laugh as well, yeah. you know what I mean? It's, you don't have to become depressed just because you're nah, religious. Of course, yeah. And like I said to the youth, you know, it's not, uh, you know, theory we're talking about. We've been through this in our own lifetimes as well. So mm -hmm. I've lived on the other side and the opposite side. And everyone who's come on to the opposite side will tell you as well that, you know, when you uh, live according to love, according to uh, fear of Allah SWT and the righteous friends, company is a difficult path, not a struggle, but alhamdulillah your heart is filled with content, your heart is content, you know, and uh, it really feels that, you know, that whatever is missing deep inside you, you feel all the time, anxiety, that is really fulfilled uh, when you when you take that path, but you got to take the first step, uh, follow this practical uh, advice. Yeah, I think it's down to the fact that, obviously I mentioned that, you know, 50 cent, get rich or die trying. We got to do it in the correct sense, right? <laughs> get rich in the sense of um, in the eyes of Allah. You know what I mean? Get rich in the fact that you build up your good rewards and die trying either yeah. way. Do you know what I mean? Instead of the opposite, you'll get rich for this dunya and die in the process. What have you really achieved? You got to do it the opposite way, where you're getting rich in terms of your good deeds, and if you die trying, inshallah, you're getting to heaven. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Heavy, heavy point. So you know, also you know. Uh, how precious the youth are to Islam and the Ummah, mm -hmm. they're very, very, very uh, important. You know, a lot of the youth as well, you know, with this kind of society we live in, the youth are made, uh, the way in the Western society see as youth has, use this time, you just chill out, waste your time, get wasted, you know, do what you want, 
And later on, when you're 30, 40s, then you settle down and have a family. And then that's when you start behaving. That, that's a secular kind of mentality that they have. Yeah. When Islam, mm. once you hit puberty, you're nine year old, you're classified as a man. You're responsible now. Mm. Whereas, uh, you know, in the Western, nine, nine years is seen as a kid. In fact, going to 30, sometimes you're seen as a kid, 25, 30. When Islam, once you hit puberty, you're a man now. And what this culture is about, based upon youth wasting their time, and what I really advise the young brothers listening to this and sisters, youth don't waste that time, it's very precious. You know, Prophet Sallallahu told us that a, a person will not move on the day of judgment until he has been asked about four things, will be asked his life and in what he spent it, his knowledge and what he done with it, his wealth, where you acquired it from, um, where you acquired it on, and where you spent it. And his own body, and how he wore it out. So you'll be a, you'll be asked about all these things. So how your life? How did you spend your time? Did you just waste it on watching Netflix series one after another over TV? Because think about what are the stats now they talk about how people spend most of their time in Western on just behind TV, yeah. Yeah. on social media or on the phones all the time. Hours and hours. Hours and hours from 24 hours a day, most of the day spent on that. Can you see how, and the Muslim Ummah, we can't be influenced by this and we badly are. We need to get out of this knowing that, look, the hours you're going to spend waste, you, you're you going to be accounted for that. The time is precious. So don't think you can, uh, although you might be doing something, uh, you might think I'm not out there committing crime or whatsoever. That's another mentality you might have. Look, I'm not out there having drugs. That's true, alhamdulillah, that's good. But still, the time you're having, what you're doing, and the very important question that everyone Muslim should ask, including myself, is what value are you bringing to the ummah or into mm. Islam? This is very, if, if the answer is no in your head, then you need to think about, okay, what do I need to do? What can I do? Yeah, I, I think in, in terms of uh, wasting time and youth not doing what they should be doing, what we need really is to well they need to educate we need to educate ourselves in terms of, of who our role models are mm. you know we look at the prophet in his life his sira we look at the sahabas we are teenagers who were generals in armies teenagers yeah, 100%, yeah. you understand these days you know they're just about to kick a football 16 17 year olds or whatever, <laughs> whatever they're doing is sitting in front of playstations or never mind being a general of an army do you know what I mean? So I think it's important to learn our history, Islamic yeah. history, read about the Sahabas, because whoever your role model is, you're going to spend your time trying to emanate them or trying to achieve what they achieved. You understand? So if, you, if somebody follows a rapper or a, a movie star, they're going to try and live their lifestyles like that. You know, those who like rappers, 50 yeah, Cent you're talking about, yeah. whoever it may be, yeah. they're going to try and copy them. The well, YouTube like influence they got now. Exactly, so the, the so-called YouTube influencers, you know, God knows what they're talking about. But <laughs> the, the thing is, look, if we have the correct role models, then, inshallah, you will take steps to become like them and live your lives how they, how they live their lives. And then, inshallah, through that, through that way, you know, there'll, there'll be a change and you, you'll take positive steps and not waste your yeah. time. For me, it's about understanding what your purpose in life is, right? So... You give up the lifestyle that is false, that is not good for you, if you understand what your purpose in life is. As a Muslim, we know our purpose in life is to submit to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and spread the Deen of Islam, right? That's why, obviously, we're telling the Muslim youth to give up these drugs and knives and stuff and start carrying the dawah, because that is the true purpose of life, right? To spread Islam to the four corners of the world and to submit yourself to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Only then can you really achieve peace and happiness and contentness within yourself because you're knowing that you're doing Allah's work and inshallah you'll be rewarded for this in the hereafter I think this is one of the main things that we need to point out oh brilliant bro, bro. yeah you know if uh, just if the youth look around you everything around you right any object yeah. where you got a chair look the manufacturer of a chair made this chair for a specific purpose your laptops your phones there's nothing around you if you look at it observe it there's not no objects around you that is made, the creator made it without having an objective for it or purpose for it. So think about this now. So how could it be that you were created 
such a magnificent creation your creator has created you without objective do you really think so so what is this objective you need to look at as well uh, because without this objective you you're just going to be just like an animal you know think about this right look at an animal look at a dog right look a dog needs to eat sleep defecate procreate he does that all all the time that's is all he does is fulfills the organic needs and instincts that's what animals do mm. think about these secular society capitalism is man not like an animal if you're yeah, just living it life to fulfill your organic needs and instincts what's the difference between <coughs> you and an animal but you do exactly the same thing so but Allah subhanahu wa tells us he's made us for a higher purpose he gives a higher objective which you mm. talked about mm. and that is the mission of the messenger so so long that all muslim youth especially you need to carry because they are the most energetic and most time and they're the ones they are the ones who are the real change changes of any society at all yeah if you want to influence a society you influence its youth because they're the next generation uh, but if the next generation is they're lazing about you know living life to the max not really understanding what's happening in the world it kind of reflects on what society it's going to be mm. right Well, if you've got a society that's very progressive, that's very knowledgeable, that's mm. very understanding of the deen, you know, that's a society that's pretty much unbeatable if, in my eyes, if you ask me. Mm. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And if you look at our history, they were unbeatable. <laughs> yeah. Because they carried these ideas and concepts. And when you carry these ideas and concepts, Allah SWT is on your side. You understand? So as a society, you become this unbeatable force, this mm. block which nobody can beat. And the only time the state declined as well is because we started moving from these ideas and mm. we started taking other alien ideas into Islam. And in a way, it started to disobey Allah SWT at, at a society level. And the end result, you can see today what's happening. You know, another very uh, practical advice for the youth as well, which really helped me as well, this constant reminder of death. So, you know, mm. just imagine if I told you that tonight, or this morning, tonight, when you go to sleep, in the morning, when you wake up, you're going to be in your grave. So now, put your life into perspective now. Everything you were thinking about running, uh, living your life for that uh, that money or that mansion or so-called Lamborghini, put that into perspective. What does that mean for you now? So if you were, you knew you're going to die tomorrow morning, you're not going to wake up. Does that be even important to you anymore? No, nothing. It kills off you. everything that deluge, that was deluding you from Uh, from uh, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah, uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reminded us that look frequently remember what ends all your pleasure and what is that? Death so rather than having this concept you know as natural you, uh, humans don't want to think about death because as human you want to live long as you want to and that death is the last thing you want to think about because it's, it's uh, you know uh, haunts you but rather than have it in the back of your head one what you do is keep you at the front of the head constantly because yeah. when you're thinking about constant death that your life is limited uh, death is inevitable that is one thing is definite going to happen your life is your death yeah. so you, there's a possibility you might get a car you might own a home or you might get a wife or whatsoever there are possibilities there's a chance you're going to have it but death we can all 100% guarantee we're all going to die Mm -hmm. So when you have this constant thought front of your head all the time, now you're going to be now aware of your every single action you're going to be taking. So every glance that you'll be taking, th that is just going to make you think twice. So every step if it's going towards the haram, is going to make you think twice. So all your interactions, your friends, is going to all start bringing you to perspective. And that is something really every Muslims, all youth, to keep constantly reminding themselves of it because why this society is based upon you know you heard, you talk about this uh, slogan called YOLO mm. you only live once so leave it large because why is is uh, with the social media and this secular society makes you want to think that you're going to live forever you're going to live for long so forget it do whatever you want but when you constantly think about death Uh, haram is the last thing you ever want to do. Yeah. I mean, if you look at it in that way as well, you know, um, and as uh, Ibn Malik did say that, you know, he heard the Prophet ﷺ say that um, 
the angel of death. He visits every single household. Guess how many times? How many? Five times. Mm, every single household. So we need to look at that perspective yeah. as well. Because, um, you know what it is as well? Does that really hit home? Because uh, there's one guy I went to school with who was in my year and stuff. I'm 23, so it's not too long ago. Um, it's about two years ago he, uh, he got run off by a bus, died on the spot. Mm-hmm. And if you think you're going to live forever, it's, it, wow. it's not the case. You, we could, I, like, how do you know you're going to wake up in the morning? Like, another example is a sister, 22-year-old, um, her wedding set. She was ready, like, I think she was going to go back home and get married and stuff. Passed away. 22-year-old. Well, she was waiting for her whole life ahead of her. Passed away. You know, uh, yeah. it's highly recommended to visit graveyards. Yeah. So what, and visit the sick. So it makes you appreciate what you have. And when you go to the graveyards, you know, uh, you look at the graves, you, you, you think to yourself, oh, the graveyards are full of uh, people who are 80, 90 year olds. No. Mate, go to the graveyard, you'll look see a amount of, even babies, you know, hundreds of graves, a baby, youth. It's incredible, you know. And so we are reminded to the youth, I don't think you're going to die when you're 80, 90. Go to the graves, you'll see loads of them. Your graves of youth. It's what expected. You don't know when you're gonna die. Mm. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> if we, if we, I mean, especially in recent times, it's we hear about so many youth passing away, and you know, many of us understand, but all of us understand that we could die any time. But in the back of our heads, always thinking, you know, oh no, I've got time yet. This thought, a lot of times, mm-hmm. you know, it'll, come, it'll, it'll pass through your mind, right? But the, but the fact is, nobody's immune from sudden death. There's so many, how many, how many people out there will have friends, uh, you know, young friends, family members, who have just gone out one morning, and next thing you know, they heard they've been stabbed, died, shot, died, died in a car accident, like the example you've given, while run over by a bus. It, it could come any, you could wake up one day and just be a normal, typical day, you could be get ready, getting ready to do whatever you do, normally do. Mm. And what you won't know is that, look, these are my last moments on earth. You could every single time, one minute you're doing one thing, next thing there's an angel death right in front of you. And it's a scary thought. It's a very scary thought. And uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, yeah, the, the Prophet Sallam, I think I read one somewhere, even he used to seek refuge from sudden death. Um, I'm not sure if that's correct, but I'm sure I read it somewhere. Yeah. But it, it, it's a scary thought, man, and it could happen to anyone. Because mm-hmm. you, to be called to accountability, like the Hebrew Prophet Sallam, for a person, individual, the day of judgment starts is when they die. You know, the, the actual day of judgment. But when you die, that's when your day of judgment begins, in a sense. And, um, yeah, we need to have, uh, like the Hadith, the brother mentioned, there is one that the Prophet Sallallahu said, you know, remember frequently the destroyer of all pleasures, which is death. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that helps us shape our life and, you know, the action we take on, on a daily basis. I think uh, one thing that we need to look at as well, because you know how the youth are going into the narrow ways in regards to drugs, etc. I mean, <clears throat> there are times where actually parents as well, like they think that the child is doing so well, they've done an extension for the house, etc. And the child saying that, yeah, I've got a job, right? What happens is that you find out that they actually do drug dealing. See, this is something, you know, definitely for, for the parents that are listening right now, you know, you do need to actually double check on, you know, what they're actually doing, whether they're at a university far away, you know, you never know, they'll probably be doing drug dealing there and there. It can happen. And that's why it's important, you know, uh, as a parent myself, you know, always focus on children when they're under your guardianship, when they're young. So you give them this correct concept that we've been talking about when they're young. But later, it will come to a point, especially when it comes to teenagers, we'll be talking about where as a parent, you will have, no matter what you want, you will have the same influence. When they go out of your control, yeah. out of your university or out of your uh, uh, side, yeah. they can do whatever they want. And you won't even know about it. And that's the reality of all the parents because how the parents know about it. But if you instill the right concepts in them, and they understood it from a young age. So I'm not talking about just telling of the rules of Islam. Yeah, of course. With all these concepts we talked about, if you drill inside their brain, no matter where they go, even when your parents are not around, mm-hmm. when it's time for Salah or uh, they will do it, it's not like, oh, my mom's not here, I don't need to pray anymore. Or I can do a haram because my parents said they will never find out. I'm at university at a different city. 
because yeah. they will have these concepts. So that's why important what we talked about in this whole podcast. Hopefully, all our listeners yeah. take all these steps, all these con- show, uh, core concepts, yeah. understand them themselves, and deliver these concepts because um, to each other. And that's what we're talking about. So what the all youth need to do understand these concepts and now convey them because the obligation of carrying the dawa and the reward of it is yeah. huge, and don't belittle themselves. You yeah. know, uh, Hadith of Prophet Sallam said, "Convey my teachings to the people, even if it's a single ayah." So don't belittle themselves. Yeah. So even if you know a simple word, even a sim- simple sentence, so you know that may be just a shahada. You know, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. That there's no deity, nothing worth the worshiping except Allah and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Find a messenger. Just even if you know that statement, it's it's to come upon yeah. you to carry this and convey to the rest of the mankind yeah. these core concepts. Mm-hmm. And you know, we talked about uh, youth. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you look at role models. The best of role models are around the youth, around the uh, Prophet Sallallahu I know a few examples, if you look at them, uh, I want you to give you an example of uh, Usama bin Zaid. You know, uh, how old do you think he was when he led the Muslim army <laughs> without <laughs> cheating? <laughs> without cheating. <laughs> and under his command, I'll give you an example, under his command, he was uh, the a- heavyweights of Abu Bakr <laughs> and uh, Umar bin Hattab. Was he 17 years old? Maybe. <laughs> Anyone else? Any guesses? I'm not sure. Yeah, 17. <laughs> you can just right, Google it. I just saw Google it. <laughs> there you go. He was 17 years old leaving the expedition. Yeah. So think about 17 years old. What do they do now? What What they seen us? They're on Snapchat. They're on Snapchat. So they're about <laughs> college time, right? Yeah. It's about sixth form college time. All the, all that's not really. He's doing A levels, maybe going to the mosque. In front of the computer, maybe. Yeah, maybe in front of the computer. Maybe well, he was scared to go to the corner shop to get a milk bottle for the mom. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Too lazy, just to like, oh, or on PlayStation. if their mom says, can you go to grab a milk? Nah, I'm, I'm watching TV. Yeah, one of them. Oh, I'll give you another example, another companion. These are really inspirational, right? Muadi bin Jabba, right? He was actually Prophet Sallallahu deputy at the conquest of Makkah. So he spent a great time at Prophet's company and he became a great scholar and jurist. How old was he when he became the uh, governor of Yemen? 23. Mm, no, I don't think it's 23. I have a guess. I think, I think it's probably a bit think older. Think about it, being a governor of Yemen. I reckon it's about 25. No, nah, 23. I'm 27 years old. Yes, yes. Asses <laughs> on it. Yes, 27 years old. Uh, 27. Uh, what's 27 year olds these days up to? Exactly. <laughs> they can't even get married by that age. Most of them, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shots fired. <laughs> you know, another heavyweight, right? Mm-hmm. Saad ibn uh, Abi Waqas, right? Um, at what age did he actually believe in Islam? 17. Yeah, 17. And you know who he was? He was the first one. He shot the arrow uh, for Islam. And he's one of the ten uh, who's been... Um, uh, given promise by Prophet Sallam for paradise, Subhan Jannah, Subhan and he was in fact one of the six nominees for the next caliph on the deathbed of Umar bin Hattab. These teenagers again we're talking about, not men. Okay, here's another one, right? Uh, Osama ibn Zaid. Do you know who he was? Okay, Osama bin Zaid, right? I'll give you insight. He was, um, he was appointed by Prophet Sallallahu as the leader of the last army he dispatched before he passed away, right? The army was actually going to confront the, went to confront the Roman army and that was one of the mightiest armies existed on earth at that time. And this army included uh, by the Muslims, companions of the Prophet, the likes of Abu Bakr, Sadiq, and Umar bin Hattab. So this teenager was leading this army expedition. How old do you think this general was? Probably about 23. 17. 18 years 18 old. 18 years old. 18, bro. Oh, think about that, man. That brings us to shame, innit? These days, you have think to Think about that. 18 years old. Like, 18. You know, just, just quickly oh. on that point, you know, um, we've got so much talent within the Ummah, it's unbelievable. 
no matter which field you look at, whether it be in terms of education, medicine, science, uh, in terms of courage, in terms of business, but there's nothing to channel that talent. You know, these examples we give, alhamdulillah, is amazing, but there was a body there, there was a government there who could channel that talent, uh, ch channel that talent in a it's good, positive way. So you had the structure there for them to join the Islamic army, to do this and do that. You had the education system there, which was, you know, emanated from Islam and stuff. Today, this whole talent is wasted because the ideology of Islam is implemented. So they either gone into rapping or whatever they're doing mostly is against Islam and, you know, is a waste of time most of it, whether it be in sports, in boxing or UFC, fighting, whatever they're into. So we need the structure back, basically. The whole Ummah needs the yeah. structure back. Once the structure comes back, you will see this talent, inshallah, flourish again. And you will see these teenagers, young, 16, 17 year olds, who today is sitting in front of PlayStation playing games. Conquering. Again, inshallah, yeah. they'll be the head of <coughs> head of armies and stuff. Scholars so inshallah, that's, the, that's how much of a dire need we need in terms of the state. It was everything, into, from resources, mm to talent of individuals and especially our youth, it's just going to waste. Yeah, I think it all really and truly stems down to the fact that um, there's a lack of Islamic leadership, right? There's a lack of Islamic unity to channel these talents, to channel these youth to achieve great things. And I think that's what the purpose of life is now then, for each individual, each, not just the youth in the Ummah, um, but is especially down to the youth, but not just the youth, to carry the dawah, to unify the Muslims again, so then, obviously, these these channels are created where the energies of the youth can be really utilised and um, it, uh, they can achieve great things. So, on a amazing points, brothers. So, hopefully, all the our listeners, the parents, the youth themselves, hopefully, take all these uh, inspiration um, examples of the companions and the prophet, use them as a, the role models, and all these concept, practical advice. We all be discussing hope, inshallah, it helps them. But uh, uh, just for me to conclude on this, uh, as a, a reminder from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in the Quran, Surah twenty nine, verse sixty four, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala reminds us: the life of this world is merely an amusement and a diversion. The true life is in the hereafter, only if they knew. So the inshallah, the real life, which is non-stop, it will never end in the hereafter, which is eternal. Yeah. Inshallah, may Allah yeah. Allah unite us all in the genital yeah. for those. That's mm. SubhanAllah, guys. So, well, I think we're going to wrap up here now. So, thank you all for listening. And again, if you are struggling with these type of issues in your life and stuff like that, feel free to message Dean Machine, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram or even on YouTube. We'll link it all in the bio, um, in the description below. Uh, make sure you like the uh, video and make sure you subscribe and share it amongst your friends and family here to spread the knowledge. Uh, once again, it's been Let's Chat, Deed Machine. We'll catch you in the next one. Assalamu alaikum.